Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Energy News Beat Daily Stand Up. Today is actually the weekend. I hope everybody is out there. Today is May 18th. I hope you had an absolutely fantastic week. Michael and I have had so much fun. We are working on deals. We are interviewing folks and we are busy. So I hope you like what the staff has got put together for us. Uh, subscribe, like, share, and we look forward to speaking to you soon. Have a great day. Talk to you soon. Hey, let's get running around to our favorite Biden. Oh my goodness. 25 states sue EPA over unachievable power plant regulations. What, besides a few billion between friends, Michael, what's one of our other greatest lines? Uh, sanctions don't work. <laughs> Regul legislation through regulatory action. I mean, you got to love the EPA continues to not fully understand the direction from the Supreme Court. Unelected bureaucrats continue their pursuit to legislate rather than rely on electric elected members of Congress for their guidance. West Virginia Attorney General Mormsey said, I love it. Here's another quote. The Green New Deal agenda the Biden administration continues to force onto the people is setting the plants to fail and therefore shudder, uh, 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 altering the nation's already stretched grid. The states, Alabama, Alaska, Arkansas, Florida, Georgia, Idaho, Iowa, Kentucky, Louisiana, Mississippi, Missouri, Montana, Nebraska, New Hampshire, North Dakota, Oklahoma, South Carolina, South Dakota, Tennessee, Texas, Utah, Virginia, and Wyoming. Wow. Any of those states? Go move into right away. <laughs> yeah, th th that is exactly. I'm surprised Florida or Florida is on that list. I was going to say, I think we're missing one, but no, Florida's definitely on that list. This is a list of states you definitely want to move through. You also exactly. have to remember West Virginia has a history of this type of success in front of the U.S. Supreme Court. They successfully fought EPA rules in 2022, as the court said, the EPA should not use its regulatory authority to create broad new regulations with the Clean Air Act. So now they're taking a step further and trying to, to move it in, into the power plants. Um, we love it. I mean, it's oh. you like you said, legislation through regulation is, is is one of the most you know, is a second order effect of having a large bureaucratic system that is absolutely unbelievable. Let's go to the House passes. Representative John Curtis bill to remove red tape around nuclear power. Michael, I love me some nuclear. And I the only way that we're going to get through low cost energy is the elimination of regulatory legislation through regulation. And Curtis, a Republican and founder of the Conservative Climate Caucus, has been a proponent of nuclear power. Quote, the cost and red tape associated with our permitting processes are providing to be duplicative and ineffective, Curtis said Thursday. We need an innovation in nuclear space to ensure affordable, reliable, and clean energy, and Congress must do the same. I am excited about this. In fact, I want to let you know that Congressman uh, Congresswoman Spatz uh, and I are uh, looking to interview on Wednesday 1030 Eastern. I'm pretty excited about that. She is a uh, congresswoman. Uh, she's actually a Ukrainian born uh, and has got a lot of great things to say. I want to reach out to him and get him on the podcast as well, too. Are you, so, are you guys live from the border? Live from the border. No, we're actually going to go live on LinkedIn. But no, I'm just I'm just giving you a hard time. But no, I mean, this has come up multiple, multiple times. If if you really want to transition and you really want to find something to replace coal as a base load energy power, nuclear is the only way to go. It really Absolutely. is. Absolutely. Gotta love me some nuclear, baby. EIA. They uh they lowered their Brent oil price forecast, Michael. And uh, I found this is because it's their STO, short-term uh, energy outlook, is what they normally produce it out in. 
is, quote, uh, however, a daily crude spot oil prices have since fallen and the Brent spot price at 84 barrels per day, May 2nd, said in the SDEO. Uh, geopolitical tensions are also supported by crude oil prices amid uh, conflict between Iran and Israel. Michael, where do you think oil prices are going? Well, I mean, if I knew that, Stu, we'd be, we'd be, I'm, I wouldn't be sharing that here and we'd be placing a lot more bets on the market. So the reality answer is, I don't know. It's clear there's a floor between, as I mentioned on yesterday's show, 70 to 75 and 85 to 90. There's that bandwidth, that oil trade. The U.S. economy can't support oil over $90, at least in the WTI standpoint. Right. From a Brent standpoint, that would be oil over 100 As much as we all love in the oil and gas business to talk about $100 oil, the United States economy couldn't support that. And mm -hmm. it would be actually devastating to lower income uh Families and overall inflation would be go rampant because a lot of the inputs that go into the inflation calculation are backed up by energy. So with that, I don't believe we're going to see oil, you know, much higher than 8590. If I had to guess, we're going to continue to trend downward um, between that 75 and 85 dollar bandwidth. We've seen oil prices um, slightly up today, hovering around that 80 dollar mark. I think, you know, the the the. What they mentioned specifically in this report, talking about how geopolitical tensions have sort of amped yeah. up relative to where, I mean, that if 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 the basis for oil prices being eighty five to ninety dollars specifically here at home have to do with geopolitical tensions, we're not always going to have geopolitical tensions. And if we do, that's not good. The fact and if and if you're if you're if you're sitting there praying for war so that oil prices are higher, well, um, yep. Lindsey Graham's got a seat at the dinner table. You can go hang out with him later. We've no, um, I, and and he's a loser. Did it, whoa, did I just say that? I oh, he's listening in on this conversation. News. He's flash. always welcome on the podcast because I have a few questions for him. Yeah. Um. The the one thing though, Michael, is we sit here and we take a look at the long term. If President Trump is elected and our uh, one of our good buddies uh, over there at the Th Crude Truth, Pecos Operating and, and uh, Trevino Family Resources, it, he has said if Republican gets in, doesn't have to be Trump, if a Republican gets in, oil prices go down. So if everybody wants lower prices at the pump, go vote for Republican. Yeah, I think you that's a, a, a really good call out on the fact of, you know, this upcoming election is going to be interesting. Now, the Biden administration is going to do whatever they can to support lower oil prices, whether that's letting out of but the SPR. It's temporary and it does not work. Well, of there, course, we know. It, we, of course, you asked me where I think oil prices are going. So I'm giving you a reasoning on where I think they might go. I think if you're talking about a bandwidth of 75 to 85 or 70 to 90, let's just expand it to 70 and 90, outside of, you know, a tactical nuclear weapon being launched in the Middle East, you know, or some crazy supply or, you know, bird flu, all of a sudden, I heard that's going crazy now, we might all of a sudden have bird, Stu shaking his head for our podcast listeners, but if bird flu becomes the next crazy event, well, then we might see prices die below, but if I had to bet if $80 plus or minus is the, the, sort of the the line if you're a gambler i'm going to take the under if only because i feel like as we move into the election season it's going to be pertinent for the current administration to make sure prices are are slow enough and you know quite frankly as somebody who drives i don't mind lower gas prices i, I don't either and and quite honestly uh, i'm going to say this out loud uh, I think the EIA, <laughs> yeah, we don't want HR uh, jumping in on it. Uh, let's all let's hold this thought. Um, I, I personally think that the EIA will fudge the numbers in order to get the numbers down uh, for the Biden administration because the job numbers have done they have done that on the job number. We know they've done it as well. So I think you're going to see the low end of this, and it's because by hook or by crook. It's going to be the low end. Wouldn't Let's have guessed. Through. Stu with a conspiracy theory wouldn't have wouldn't have didn't see that one coming. It, Michael, you know what the difference between a conspiracy theory and a fact is? Two weeks, uh, less than one week now because of <laughs> <laughs> we're down to one week. 
down oh, to well, one week. Right. <laughs> U.S. shale companies accused of collusion over oil price. And normally I don't make a big deal about this, but this is, you know, That's, the oil and gas industry is getting, yeah, the oil and gas industry is getting pounded from all cents. Fresh off of the FTC blocking Scott Sheffield from joining the Exxon Mobil board from the Exxon Pioneer um, merger. Um, a new barrage of lawsuits alleging that some of the largest companies in the sector, and I'm reading now straight from the article, uh, alleging some of the largest companies in the sector colluded to curb and output and raise prices after similar claims were made by U.S. antitrust regulators. Okay, this is absolutely hilarious, Stu. Okay, talk about having your cake and eating it too. The lawsuit takes aim at the industry's model of capital discipline in which producers have pivoted from rapidly building up production in response to high prices in re recent years in favor of funneling cash back to investors. Let me get this straight. Let me just get this straight. So when we were pumping up production as fast as possible, people were jumping down the U.S. industry's throats because they were responsible for climate change. And now, as they've pulled back on production, shift their focus into one shareholder returns, but also everyone's out there talking about, you know, net zero 2050, net zero 2040, all that jazz. Now, all of a sudden, they're in trouble because they haven't rapidly increased production. It's absolutely unbelievable, Stu. They're attempting to have their cake and eat it, too. Plaintiffs in New Mexico allege the group's collective failure to open the taps as crude prices soared in wake of the Russian invasion of Ukraine was a departure from the historical practice and rational, independent self-interest. Well, wait a second. Wait a second. Wait a second. Wait a second, guys. The goal of a business is to make money. Why were invest? Why was why were oil companies drilling like crazy and raising production? Uh, uh, a a a any ideas? And this is a rhetorical question because we know what the answer is. Because that's what investors wanted, and investors were pouring money to make that happen. Oh, oh, well, when the investors oh. shifted and saying, "Well, we actually realized that all of this production that you made didn't actually benefit the shareholders," which a business oh. their explicit goal is to make money for its investors. Hold on, Stu. Hold on, Stu. Let me finish this. Um, now, all of a sudden, when they shift, when in when, when they continue to follow what investors say, but investors have changed their mind and say, we actually want a little bit of ESG. We want a little bit of uh, 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 stock buybacks. It's now the oil company's fault because they're in cahoots with OPEC? I don't understand. No. Now, let me ask something. Isn't there this thing called... ESG, environmental, social, and governance. And governance is about being uh, responsible to your stakeholders. You mean the oil and gas companies were actually following the credence of ESG? I mean, one of the companies named in this lawsuit is Chesapeake Energy. If I don't have to remind you the fact that they went bankrupt. <laughs> So I mean, what 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 do they want? What is this? Uh, what's this guy's name? Thomas Bird, <laughs> a partner at Wolf Halvenstein. What a name. Okay. Quote, not the first time people in the oil and gas business make made a made a mess that will take a lot to clean up. Damages are significant. Yeah, to, to shareholders, trust me. Class is likely to encompass roughly four years of gasoline sales to two-thirds. Of American consumers. Does he have any idea what he's talking about? Hurt? Nope. It's 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 pretty it's it's pretty crazy. Um you know, of course, you know Let's they, see if we can get him they, on they the claim the FTC's allegations of collusive behavior between Exxon and Pioneer didn't have anything to do with it. So I, I I'm I'm just shocked. I'm just shocked at the lack and the incompetence that some of these people show. And a lot of this stuff is just hand-waving. It's just hand-waving. Um, it's despicable is what it is. I mean, just mm -hmm. flat out. It's, like it's, Sheffield is going to go call up OPEC and go, hey, uh, let's collude on some prices. You got to be kidding me. Well, it, the problem is it, at the end of the day, a business is designed to make money. And if you have an issue with that, then you have an issue with capitalism. And your issue shouldn't be with oil and gas. It should be with the overall framework of the United States economy. You can go have that battle. 
I don't care. Go argue in front of the Supreme Court that capitalism is bad. And all. I don't care. We won't cover it on Energy News. Beat. You're not going to, you know. But but when you cherry pick the oil and gas business, and why do you do this? Well, because there's a lot of money in it. So it 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 it, it just cracks me up. They want to have their cake. They want to have, they want to eat it too. They want it delivered to their house. They want it with a little extra frosting on top, and they want to be spoon fed. It's at some point you've got to do a little bit of work yourself. Trump vows day one executive order targeting offshore wind. There's a couple of really big hidden nuggets in this story. We are going to make sure, this is a quote, uh, we're going to make sure that uh, day that ends on day one. I'm going to write it out in an executive order, said Trump, on his uh, trip to uh, Wildwood, New Jersey on Saturday. Uh, he has... Uh, the, he wasn't specific. A president could uh, impact the executive order with a fresh study. Uh, the offshore wind farm and the uh, the whales went crazy when they heard this. Do you know that the right whales are approaching endangered um, a species? But yet the uh, developers have gone out and they have applied for more tags knowing that they're going to kill more than the actual species has left alive. They, they are endangered. Where is the outcry? Good for President Trump on uh, saying that he is going to stop offshore wind farms. Hey, if that it can be done without harming the whales, let's talk about it. Let's make it fiscally responsible. Let's talk about it. But I'll tell you what, it is not fiscally responsible. And the birds and the eagles and the bats in the wind, I am not a wind farm kind of fan. Good for President Trump. But I want a question here. What is going to be the backlash? Is this going to be now a calling card for the Democrat Party to say he is anti-renewable energy? And that this is going to be a major uh, issue that he's going to do this from day one. A, I agree with it. But B, is this going to be a calling card for the Democrat Party saying, hey, we're going to try to do this. So it's going to be interesting to see how this all plays out. It's very important. And if you are an environmentalist, you need to really pay attention and learn the facts on offshore wind. I'm all about getting the lowest kilowatt per hour to everyone on the planet and not killing the eagles, birds, whales. Biden ratchets up tariffs on Chinese EVs, solars and batteries. Um, the Biden administration moved on Tuesday to block China's access to the American market for clean energy technology, doubling duties on solar cells and effectively quadrupling the price of electric vehicles from China. Now, there's more to this story, and it really is despicable. Duties will triple this year on EV batteries and other battery parts to 25%. The same 25% rate will be imposed on some steel and aluminum products. 25% duty will go into force on critical minerals, uh, cobalt, magnesium, mag, uh, magne magnesium, and zinc are the same tariff rate, and graphite will be permanent magnets in 2026. So these new trade rules will tighten the ongoing tensions between nurturing the countries, young, clean energy, employing clean energy. This is absolutely a, a an example of the Biden administration not understanding how businesses operate. And uh, to quote, China is using the same playbook it has before to power its own growth at the expense of others by continuing to invest despite excess Chinese capacity and flooding the global markets. All it's going to do is hurt the consumer. How tariffs threaten Biden's climate goals. 
the climate goals and the climate crisis, I think there's more to this story than you need to make sure you're paying attention to. This uh, quote unquote from David Rapson, an economist at the University of California, quote, this is probably not good climate policy. <laughs> It certainly will slow the adoption of clean energy technologies in the short term and will likely slow them in the long term as well. You know, um, the, Biden is quadrupling the tax on the Chinese electric vehicles to 100%. This is actually very dumb on all aspects of this because he's also taxing the batteries, the components, the critical minerals and everything else, if they're trying to do grid expansions and energy security, they're not considering into this. They need to be more specific and targeted, lower the costs so that Tesla, so that any of the other U.S. manufacturers can get the tax credits because right now their regulatory actions going from uh you don't get the tax credit, you get the tax credit. You get the tax credit, you don't get the tax credit. No wonder the EV manufacturers are failing in the U.S. is because 100% because of the energy policies of the Biden administration. So between these two stories, it's pretty much an eyeful for you there.